You know, it's always good when bishops can learn new things. For instance, I shouldn't follow Father Brooke speaking up here. <laughs> what a great testimony. Thank you so much. Very briefly, it's a joy to be here as Chloe's grandfather and uh, <laughs> Stephanie and I have just taken great delight in making our transition from the Pacific Northwest down here to the great state of Texas and Arlington and our new church family. Thank you for your welcome and your prayers. It's meant so much to us. I have stories to tell, but we have not that much time tonight. So I'll give you just a little insight of how I was called to the ministry uh, through Whisper of the Holy Spirit. It was when I was a junior in high school, and I took the Cooter Occupational Test, which compared your gifts for uh, work and skills to various professional uh, jobs around the nation. So my result came back, and it said, of your three top positions that you match up with, one is pastor, the second is university pastor, and the third was podiatrist. <laughs> Washing of feet came to mind, but we won't go further with that. So it was back in uh, 2011 we formed the uh, Diocese of Cascadia, and as part of our DNA, we wanted to be members of a global community, not just a parish, a diocese, working together in a particular region. And so we had the great joy of making a companion diocese relationship with Yangon and Myanmar. Archbishop Stephen Tan uh, was in contact with us and started praying with us. And Stephanie and our son John, now Father John, uh, joined us for our first trip to Myanmar to meet the people and the Archbishop to see how we could be involved in mutual ministry. Now this is a very important aspect of SOMA, as well as much of our ACNA international work. We are part of a biblically faithful global Anglican movement. So we don't go to do mission to people. We go to share mission together. And that is a great blessing to us all. Now in that relationship, we learn things about each other, including ourselves. Now you've heard a great testimony about the ministry that changes lives, changes families, uh, changes communities in the church. I'd like to take a different approach this evening in light of the fine testimony we heard and talk a little bit about another change that sometimes is more difficult, and that is changing the church and changing its key leadership. We all need that guidance of the Holy Spirit, and from time to time we need to be reminded that it all begins simply with the relationship with Jesus Christ and his call to us to care for one another and bring people, more people, into heaven with us. So being able to work then in the context of SOMA and international ministry, we had that first trip to Myanmar as a SOMA mission, and that's 2014, I think it was. And I'm so thankful that uh, Dr. Glenn invited me to be part of that. Uh, we arrived at the country uh, to take up our first teaching of four weeks with four different bodies with the College of Bishops. Now, they were a, a heroic group of the faith. To back up and let you understand a little bit of the context, it was late in the 1940s that a military coup took over Myanmar, and then there was a civil war that followed for 50 years, the longest active civil war in the world in that whole period of time. And in that period of time, the church was persecuted, not just by the issue of dealing with the, the war, but also because it was involved with a country that was primarily Buddhist. Now, I'm not saying that Buddhists are bad people. Don't hear me say that. But the Theravada strain of uh, Buddhism liked to evangelize other people. Now, that's a good thing when you think about it, as we wish to do so. So they were in competition with us for the hearts and minds of people uh, to love and serve God. So with the oppression of the war, with the competition of the very majority uh, community of, of Buddhists there, it was very hard to be faithful in a public setting in that community. And furthermore, they kicked out the British that were part of building the church there in the mid-60s. And overnight, they had to raise up indigenous leadership to take the roles of these uh, fine people who served in Myanmar for many years. So here is a church frozen in time due to these issues. 
And again, let me remind you, these are heroes of the faith. When you came into the community of uh, Myanmar at that time, it was very oppressive. There were soldiers with automatic weapons on every street corner. They had signs saying, do not talk to the strangers. The people there had a, a sort of a downcast demeanor when they're on the public streets and so on until you walked through the church doors. And then you were able to receive the, the love of Christ, the great warmth that comes from Burmese people that they're actually very famous for outside of the last half century. So it was in the context again that we came and met with the College of Bishops. And they had, I said, as I said before, a, a leadership that was frozen in time. They were so hierarchical that the bishops really did not interact much with the laity. In fact, it was very odd for a lay person to come up and shake the hand of a bishop. They were so frozen in time with their hierarchical leadership that the clergy were people that they directed, but in a way that was perhaps not as pastoral in our modern day that we would like to be receiving care from bishops. And the Archbishop Stephen Tan said, I'd like us to move past this cycle. Please teach our bishops about uh, healing ministries, about forgiveness and reconciliation. Please teach them about discipleship and collegial ministries. And so we began to work with them and teach them these things, and it was almost like a dam broke. They were so overwhelmed with the new possibilities that they had not been comfortable even examining that they said to us at the end of the session, please come and teach our clergy and our people in our diocese. They had a change of heart. They had a change of calling with how they were to be leaders of the people of God. Now think on this. I can go and have a Bible study with five people in Yangon and they would have transformed lives, we hope and pray, and through the Holy Spirit, they would meet maybe five more, 10 more people and share that love. But when you have five bishops whose hearts are transformed, you're impacting thousands of people through how they lead changed leadership in life. 70,000 people, no doubt, receive the impact of the teaching and the movement of the Holy Spirit from that week with the bishops. Isn't that extraordinary? It's miraculous. So to have a more personal example of that, we went to the Diocese of Mandalay. And uh, it, by the way, have any of you heard of the movie The Road to Mandalay? We just dated ourselves, I know. <laughs> so, so Mandalay is this beautiful uh, city in the center of Myanmar, and it has a very rich history. And they have a cathedral church that's absolutely gorgeous. And they had just had an election there of a new bishop. Now, remember, I said they're frozen in time, and they had all these challenges to bishop and priest and laity uh, relationships and how they work together. There was division in the diocese. There were factions amongst the people there. This is a young bishop, and the older priest said, mm, we're not so sure you're our bishop, even though he was elected. So it looked like there was going to be some very difficult times ahead for the people of God there. And in that time, led by Dr. Glenn, our team prayed about that and discerned that we needed to change some of the focus of our teaching. And Glenn led off with a wonderful Bible study on reconciliation and forgiveness and unity, a call to be one in Christ. And then the next step was that we developed with them a process of going through and making a covenant with one another about how to be in unity, how to love each other, to serve God in a united mission for Christ rather than being in divided and conflicting factions. And they signed it after voting for it unanimously. And then the part that was very moving for me in the midst of that, which demonstrated this unity, this change of heart of leadership, was that I invited Bishop David to do something that was very uncomfortable for him and the people around him. Remember the distance between clergy, laity, and bishops. I asked him to sit in the middle of the cathedral and allow, and that's the right word to use, allow the laity and clergy to gather around and lay their hands on him and pray. Pray for their bishop. Now what happened was very moving because I expected our timid Burmese people who don't like to speak out loud in groups like this, especially the laity in church, to maybe bravely give one or two sentences of prayer what happened was the cathedral exploded in prayer. 
The change of heart in that diocese was demonstrated by the fact that that diocese grew over the next few years and birthed two new dioceses. That is the impact of the movement of the Holy Spirit for a change in the hearts of leaders of the church. Very powerful. Now another more personal story in Mandalay is uh, where I learned a few things about the movement of the Holy Spirit in my role as a bishop. Um, we had a healing service that was called for. And uh, I hadn't been part of a missional healing service before, so this was a new experience for a rather young bishop. And uh, I went up to uh, Dr. Glenn and I said, uh, so uh, what does this look like? What's involved? And he said, well, we'll have probably a few healings, uh, maybe a couple of deliverances, and cast out a few devils. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, that's rather interesting. <laughs> and my interior voice went, they didn't teach us this in seminary. <laughs> So I said, well, how do we get ready for this? Well, we pray, we do preparations, and then we'll go up and see what God provides for us, and the Holy Spirit will do working through us. Well, that's well and good. So I reflected a little bit more. Not only did they not teach us this in seminary, but I had no idea how you cast out a devil. I can you know, deal with a dog in a yard, but this was new to me. <laughs> and deliverance sounded like volunteering for Meals on Wheels. So I, I was truly a deer in the headlights. I tried to cover that as best I could. I said, well, let's see how we will do this. And using this calm exterior wise panic and inside, I said, well, Dr. Glenn, why don't we do this together model ministry of lady and bishops working together? <laughs> and my inner voice is going, oh, please, Glenn, work beside me. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so he was very gracious and went with me up to the altar rail. Now, of course, the first persons that came up were two men. One was deaf, and the other was his friend that brought him up to the rail. And we could understand, of course, the gentleman wanted to be healed. And then we got the story about how he became deaf. You see, he was a bit of a poor man, and his son was deathly ill five years before. And they took him to doctors and clinics and hospitals. Uh, they tried many, many things, and he was never healed. This Nothing happened to save him in this. So the man who was a Christian finally broke down. He took his son to a witch doctor. And the witch doctor did his machinations and invocations and such, and he cured the son. But instantly, the son's devil went into him and struck him deaf. He'd been deaf for five years. That's rather extraordinary. So they come forward and they are asking for healing from the leaders of the church. Now, I'm sitting there again, as you have had a taste of, like a deer in the headlights, and I was praying to God, whatever shall I do? And somehow in the midst of that prayer, it changed because I, God spoke to me and simply said, you are my anointed apostle. You are the spiritual authority here. You must proceed. So I dared to go where I had not gone before, not quite sure knowing what I was going to do. And it's interesting how God works in these scenarios. Actually, I wrote this pattern down. You could help me with this in just a moment here. I certainly needed all the help I could have at that time, I'll tell you now. All right, so let me pull this up. So I'm pondering what to do. I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me. I have Glenn riding shotgun for me to help me out. And then as I was praying, now you can see these words. It occurred to me, you ready? It occurred to me, very good. So it occurred to me, all together, it occurred to me that before dealing with this, I needed to pray that God would protect this, dead, uh, this deaf man's family and us as well. So in this case, we wanted to pray a prayer of coverage so that if the devil jumped from person to person, as in the pigs of Gadarene, that we would be covered and safe. Ready? Then it occurred to me 
that he should confess that he should not have gone to the witch doctor. Instead, he should have sought God's healing love. His friends translated all this by shouting into the man's ear, who eagerly nodded yes. And after confession, I prayed the absolution that God would forgive all his sins, to restore and renew whatever had been corrupted by the devil and restore him to new life in Jesus Christ, which is a prayer of our baptismal services, by the way. Ready? Then it occurred to me to pray the prayer from baptism. Almighty God, deliver you from the powers of darkness and evil and lead you into the light and obedience of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And with the help of his friend yelling in his ear, we led him to reaffirm his faith in Christ. Then I anointed him with holy oil, and then and I laid hands on him and prayed for healing. At first he only recovered part of his hearing, so he prayed some more, and his hearing was finally restored. Thanks be to God. Amen. But, my friends, how did it occur to me to speak this way? How did it occur to me to address these matters as a leader, a bishop of the church, for which I'd not been trained to do these things? Well, we realize, of course, that what we're able to do is by the grace of God and not by our own knowledge and strength, isn't it? So I have a part two of the story. I'm going to invite Father John to come up and share part two of the story. Part two. The sequel. So a couple years after the story that he just told with that healing ministry, I was asked by the Diocese of Cascadia, you know, I knew a guy, who uh, to lead a youth mission trip over to uh, come alongside of our brothers and sisters in the Anglican Church of Myanmar under Archbishop Stephen. And, uh, you know, eventually I managed to put together a team. It was a little bit of a hard sell going up to various parents in the diocese and saying, hey, do you want to send your high schooler with me to the jungles of Southeast Asia where there's soldiers in every street corner with machine guns? It'll, it'll be great for them, I promise. Right. Somehow I put together a team and we went out. And I happened to know uh, a young bishop, actually, uh, by the name of Sun U, uh, because he had gone to seminary here in America and ended up being a classmate uh, with myself and Father Andrew. So when he found out that I was there with the youth, he said, you've got to come to my church. You've got to come to my diocese. It was one of these new young dioceses that came out of the Diocese of Mandalay, actually, when it grew after that trip that Bishop Kevin was describing. So we hopped on a bus and drove through the jungle and came to his church. And the next morning, we got there very late. He let us uh, go sleep in our rooms. And the next morning, I got a frantic knock on my door very early, and I kind of uncoiled myself from this Myanmar-sized bed that was not designed for a six-foot-two American. And there was Bishop Sun Hu, and he said, hey, I, I have someone you need to come and meet. You need to come and see him. I'm like, okay, I'll get in the shower. No, 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 right now. Okay. So I went out, and there, sitting on the front doorsteps of the church, was all these young Myanmar folks, smiling, very excited to meet me. And the gentleman who was kind of their, their leader, he stood up and came up and eagerly shook my hand, and Bishop Sanu, who was translating me uh, for me, said, you need to hear this man's story. So this young man, this leader of this group, apparently he was a, uh, a young lay leader in the church and had been for uh, a while. And they determined that he had the gift of evangelism, right? So one day, Bishop uh, Sanu and various other leaders in the diocese came and laid hands on him, kind of a, you know, St. Paul being sent out to the Gentiles and said that they felt he was called to go up into the mountains of northern Myanmar, an area that had been mostly cut off from the rest of the country because of the war, and go and take the gospel to all these tribes out there that had never heard the name Jesus Christ before. So they gave him enough money for about two months to be, cover basics, a bicycle to get up into the mountains, because you couldn't take a car up there, a guitar, because he could sing, and they thought that'd be a good source of evangelism. And so with the Bicycle, guitar, smile on his face, and a prayer in his heart, he went up into the mountains. And it was a disaster. For two months, he went from tribe to tribe, place to place, and he would play music and sing songs. He would go and gather children. He would go and speak with the village elders, and nothing, nothing. He would pray fervently every night, and again, nothing. No one responded. There was no interest and a month went by, two months went by. He ran out of funds, 
And then he was basically just living on handouts from the very people he was trying to win over to the gospel, and nothing. He would cry out, okay, God, what's this all about? Where are you? And so then finally, when really it had been more than three months, and he had gone beyond his resources, he got on that bike, not a smile on his face this time, pedaled back down from the mountains, and returned feeling like a failure. So Bishop Sonu was ministering to him and consoling him. And he told him about this event that was happening in the Mandalay Cathedral where an American bishop and the head of a SOMA team for the United States was coming to do a healing service. And he said, why don't you go and pray that the Lord would minister to you there? All right. So he did. And the way he tells it to me is he sat just in the very back of the cathedral. Again, so dejected, he didn't even want to go up front and be part of it. But then he told me this. He said, I looked up when they brought a man who could not hear before this American bishop, who I'm told is your father. And when your father laid his hands on that man and on his head, a light suddenly appeared. And I saw an angel standing and placing his hands on Bishop Kevin as Bishop Kevin laid his hands on this man. I looked around flabbergasted and no one else seemed to see it, but I could see it clear as day. And the angel was mouthing a prayer right behind the bishop as he spoke for this man and prayed for him. And then he said, as I stared, and as I watched my jaw on the floor, the angel with his hands on Bishop Kevin suddenly turned and looked directly at him and shook his finger at him. You know you're in trouble when an angel shaking a finger at you. And the angel said, who are you to complain? The Lord your God is with you. His Holy Spirit is with you. Why are you here? So he finished that story. And after I stopped crying all the way through it, I, I asked him, okay, and did you go back? His smile came back. He turned around, pointed at all the people that were sitting on the porch of that church, and he said, I want to introduce you to the first believers in the mountains of northern Mandalay. Wow. And just to show you how God works in mysterious ways, it comes full circle, because the next thing I said is, I gotta go, go wake up my youth. Can you tell that story again? <laughs> And the blessing spread from there. It's very humbling to be shaped and formed by the Holy Spirit in leadership, whether we're laity or priests, deacons, or bishops. But the one the thing I wanted you to take away from this evening uh, is that not only is the Holy Spirit working to change lives, He's changing leaders and the church to change more lives. That's one of the most formidable tasks, I think, in Christendom. But it happens miraculously. And one of the great things about Soma is that we do these biddings by the bishops and archbishops to come into their diocese, to meet with their people, to pray with them, to share with them, to teach things that are helpful in the midst of their ministries right then, very valuably, for the power of the Holy Spirit. And that impacts dioceses and parishes and families and lives. SOMA is probably the most extraordinary international ministry in Anglican circles that impacts thousands, in part because it impacts and changes the lives of leaders of the church. Thank you. Thank you for 